today in the Physics Funhouse, we are investigating the factors that affect the period, or the time period, for oscillation of a mass on a spring. And there's three factors that we're going to check briefly to see if they even um, change the period of a mass on a spring. And that's the spring constant, the mass, and the amplitude of its motion. So here we've got our mass on a spring system. This is a red spring, and I've hung a 500 gram mass on there. And if I just kind of set that in simple harmonic motion, you get an idea for about how long that takes. So first, let's see if the spring constant matters. The spring constant I can change just by grabbing a different spring. So the spring is yellow. Putting the same size mass on it, so this is a 500 gram mass. I'm gonna try to release them both at the same time. Three, two, one, go. So hopefully you can see that the period of oscillation is shorter for the yellow spring. The yellow spring has a higher spring constant, which leads to a shorter time period. The spring is stiffer, so it pulls towards the equilibrium with more force for a given displacement than the red spring does. So the first factor that affects the time period for a mass on the spring is the spring constant. Next, let's see if the mass has an effect. So both of these have the same mass. So keeping in mind, I only want to change one thing at a time. Let's put the same mass, or excuse me, different masses, on the same kind of spring. And so these are both red springs. If I put the same mass on them, you can see that they stretch by the same amount. They have the same spring constant. Let's, let's put a different mass on this one. Let's see if a one gram kilogram mass will fit. Not really. Let's try the 200 gram mass. Okay, so I've got a 200 gram mass on one of my red springs and a 500 gram mass on the other. Let's displace them both a little bit and let's see how they move. Three, two, one. So hopefully you see that with less mass, the period of oscillation um, is much shorter. Let's kind of reset that a little bit here. Let's try 300 grams to get better results. Try to keep everything in the shot. Okay, so hopefully you can see that the spring over here with less mass is moving, um, or the time period is shorter for the spring that has less mass on it. And so more mass, longer period, which should make sense because more mass means more inertia, more resistance to acceleration. And so this is more difficult to accelerate, so it kind of makes sense that it take more time for it to accelerate. So the mass matters when determining the period of a mass on a spring. The last possible um, factor is the amplitude, like how far I pull it down before I release it. And so let's take the same mass and the same spring. So these are both 500 gram masses. And I'm gonna displace them different amounts. I'm gonna displace the one on the right just a little bit. I'm gonna displace the one on the left a lot. And let's see if there's any noticeable difference in the period. Three, two, one, go. So even though the one on the left is moving a lot further up and down, it's basically returning to the bottommost point at approximately the same time. It's bouncing a little bit and my support up here is flexing. Let's see if we can reset that one. Three, two, one, go. So the first approximation, those are moving up and down at about the same rate, even though the one on the left is moving further each time than the one on the right. And as my pole flexes a little bit, that kind of sort of, the, the pole flexing up here is adding a little bit of motion to the one on the left. And so to the first approximation, we can say that the amplitude of a simple harmonic oscillator does not determine its period. So the thing that we're going to do next is adjust the mass and see if we can write an equation for how the mass affects the period of a mass on a spring. So what we're going to do now is do a simple experiment to determine how the mass that we put on a spring 
affects the period of oscillation for that mass on a spring system. So we're going to do a bunch of different masses. We're going to time the period. And for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna go old fashioned and use an iPhone timer to do that. Um, and then change up the mass and see how that affects the period. So I'm gonna try to keep the timer in the shot so that you guys know I'm not making this stuff up. And um, hopefully we can get as much of the data in the frame as well as we go. We'll just kind of see how it goes. So the starting mass I'm gonna use is 300 grams. So just like that. And that's kind of actually the minimum amount to stretch this particular spring out so that it'll actually oscillate and not just like go up and then start bouncing on the support. So I'm gonna set this thing in motion. I'm gonna to try to pull it down just a few centimeters each time because um, I don't want it bouncing up here. Um, remember the amplitude doesn't really affect the period. So, okay, I'm gonna let it get moving. Make sure it's not bouncing. And then I'm gonna time it for 10 oscillations. And then I can just divide by 10 to get the period for one. So there's our data table for our mass on the spring lab. Um, let's go grab a spreadsheet and graph that data um, because there's a couple things we're gonna need to do with it. And I would encourage you to graph the data and do everything that I'm gonna show you um, yourself because uh, we are gonna learn a new skill here along the way. So let's grab a spreadsheet and look at that data together. Okay, so here we have our data from our lab. On the y-axis, I've graphed the period, the time period, and on the x-axis, I've graphed the mass, and the dots are kind of yellow. I really can't figure out how to make the Excel dots bigger yet. Um, and so you might look at that data, and you might think that that's kind of sort of linear. Uh, there's three problems with that statement, though. Statement number one, if we were to try to fit a best fit line to this, um, I'm just kind of using my ruler as a guide, um, you'll notice that if you try to line up the ruler with the dots, it's kind of matching up nicely here, but not so much there. And if you try to scooch it up, now all these dots are below. And if you try to adjust it a little bit, you're not going to really ever get a decent best fit line out of that data without it like being all above or all below or something like that. The second problem with that is it's got a really big y-intercept. So if I were just to draw some rando best fit line on this, it's not a terrible best fit line, 
Um, but it's got a really big y-intercept of like 0.5 seconds. And so let's think about what physically that should mean. What that's indicating that is if we hung zero mass on that um, spring, then it would oscillate with a period of half a second. That doesn't really scan, does it? Like if I would put zero weight on that thing, like it wouldn't really do anything. It would have a period of zero if such a thing could exist. And so the third issue with that is it doesn't match the theory. Well, you guys don't know the theory yet, so let's kind of ditch that for right now. But that's probably not a linear shape. In fact, ooh, let's redo that. Get rid of this line. Um, the, the period should be zero when there is zero mass on there. That's kind of like theoretically what we should kind of do a little thought experiment and go, if I hung zero mass on it, it wouldn't really oscillate. That would give it a period of zero. And so if we included zero in our thinking and think, hey, this should go through the origin, that's way too big a y-intercept just to be error, then you end up with kind of like a curve like this. And that curve is real nice with the first set of data, and then it deviates from those last four points. And if you remember, that's where I moved it up to the higher peg. And so I'm wondering if there wasn't some wiggling or if I did something different with my timing after I moved it up. Um, so it still matches the trim, but it's just kind of shifted up just a little bit from it. And so if you look at that kind of a graph, what we need to be able to do, those of you that have been in Algebra 2 before, is recognize that as a square root curve. Like that means y is proportional to the square root of x. And really there's three nonlinear functions that we need to recognize in physics one, square root being one of them, something like this, where y is proportional to x squared being the other one, and then something like this, where y is proportional to 1 over x being the third. And then we can recognize those three shapes so we can deal with any kind of data that we might see, even if it's not linear in physics one. If you're down the line, you'll learn more of those, but we'll get to those when we get to those. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we want to write an equation for our data, like always. It's really difficult to write an equation that looks like this because it doesn't match what we know about equations for best fit lines, namely y equals mx plus b. And so our goal is to make this straight. And so if y is proportional to the square root of x, when we graph y versus the square root of x, like if we literally take our x values and square root them, then if y is proportional to the square root of x, that should give us a straight line. So when we recognize that, we just got to take the square root of whatever our x values were, graph that on the x-axis instead, and then that should give us a nice straight line. So let's do that. We've got Excel open. I'm going to make a new column. I'm just going to scooch my periods over here. And I'm going to call that mass squared. And the, or excuse me, square root of mass. And that would be like the square root of kilograms. So kilograms to the minus one half power would be the, the way to write that. Let's kind of zoom in on the data here so we can see a little bit easier. Let's go ahead and delete the old graph. Yeah, it doesn't like that. Okay. And so to take the square root of all those masses, it's really easy with a spreadsheet. I'm just going to make a formula. So to start formula, I do equals. Square root, you type in SQRT. Um, and if you ever don't know the way to type something in in Excel, if you kind of start typing it, like a context menu will pop up that might help you out. Um, you can always search for them as well. There's thousands of functions in Excel. Square root of that mass, and then close the parentheses, press enter. And so it takes the square root of 0.3 for me. And then to copy it, I just go over here to that um, bottom right corner, a little box, cursor kind of changes when you go over it, drag it down, and there's all the square roots of all my masses. And I'm just going to kind of clean that up a little bit by going back to home. And this button over here kind of reduces the decimals that get reported. So I don't need 15 decimal points on this. Okay. And so I'm going to select these two things now. Go to insert. And then do a scatter plot. 
And that looks like a really nice straight line. Let's make it dark background again. There we go. And so you'll notice again that kind of that little jump when uh, between the first set of data and then when I moved that peg up. So I don't know if I did something when I did that, um, if it was bouncing more or what. Um, but otherwise, that makes a pretty good straight line. And so if I add a trend line, um, and I'm going to forecast it backwards so I can see the y-intercept. So maybe 0.5 will do the trick. Not quite. Do 0.6. So with that graph, this is over here is periods again. This over here now is the square root of x, not x, but the square roots of x. Notice I didn't use x's, or uh, masses rather, square root of masses, um, when I did that. Um, notice you get a real nice straight line, and it's got a y-intercept of practically zero. And so that's what we would expect. We expect zero mass to give us zero period. Um, and now, since it's a line, I can get the equation of that line. So I can do that just by formatting my trend line, display the equation on the chart. So I get a slope, I'm going to route to the nearest significant figure for my lab of 1.2, and then a y-intercept that is essentially 0.0096 seconds, so a hundredth of a second, a thousandth of a second, sorry. Um, that, that's practically zero. So my equation then, since I know that this is y, Copy and paste this to the whiteboard. I didn't label my axes when I made my spreadsheet, sorry. So over here, this is my time, and time period is in seconds. This is the square root of mass. And you can write the square root of a kilogram, or kilogram to the minus one-half power, whatever you want. And so it's a y equals mx plus b thing again. And so t would equal 1.2. And the unit for the slope would be the unit of the y-axis over the unit for the x-axis. So seconds per square root kilogram. I'm going to go ahead and put that in parentheses since it's yucky. Um, that is my slope, times my x variable is the square root of, you know, there's the equation that matches my data. So I talked earlier about the theory, like theoretically, that shouldn't be a straight line. In theory, t equals, for a spring, 2 pi times the square root of m over k, where k is our spring constant. So what I might want to do with this data now is get the spring constant um, and kind of confirm that the spring constant I get matches the spring constant that's on the box. That would probably tell me that the physics I'm teaching you right now was correct if that happened. So if I kind of break this up to look more like my equation from above, I can say that the period of a mass on a spring is equal to 2 pi times the square root of k I'm just going to break this up into variables and constants. And so this stuff right here is all the constants, and then times the square root of m. And so since it's a y equals mx plus b equation, that, what's multiplied by my x variable, must be equal to the slope. Okay, well, I have a slope. The slope is 1.2. And so just using that slope, I can calculate the spring constant. And so slope equals 2 pi over the square root of k. Multiply both sides by the square root of k. And I really wish we had a better symbol for slope than m. Because m is mass, it's going to get really confusing if I use m for slope right here. Um, and so if I divide both sides by slope and then square everything, square root of k equals 2 pi over the slope. 
And then if I square both sides of that to undo the square root, I get something like this. Okay, equals 2 pi over my slope squared. Okay. So let's do some number crunching. Okay, equals 2 times pi. My slope again is 1.2 in this instance. Ah, ah, ooh, ah. 1.2, and then we need to square that. So let's go grab a calculator here. Okay, so 2 times pi divided by 1.2 is 5.2, squaring that. I get 27.4 for the spring constant. And let's not worry about the units right just now. Um, that should be newtons per meter if I've done everything correctly. Okay, so um, I don't know if you noticed that was a red spring that I was using back there. I'm going to go get the box and see what the red spring spring constant is supposed to be. I'll be right back. So there's the box, and on the box, it tells you what the spring constants of all the different springs are. And so if you look there, the red spring has a spring constant of 25 newtons per meter, plus or minus 5%. What that means is that not all of these things have exactly the same spring constant, because that would be a lot more expensive for your manufacturing process. And PASCO, they manufacture things for teachers like me. 5% is good enough. And so 25 newtons per meter, plus or minus 5%, falls exactly in line with my calculated spring constant of 27.4 newtons per meter. And so the fact that the spring constant I calculated from doing all that matches what's on the box probably means that I did the lab correctly and I'm doing the physics that you guys are learning correctly as well. So, we should be pleased with ourselves. To recap, when we graphed our data, we recognized it was not linear. That's kind of the trickiest part to this. Um, so when you think you have a straight line on your data, you might want to stop and go, do I really have a good best fit line? And then should the y-intercept be whatever the y-intercept would be if it was linear? So in this case, the fact that the y-intercept is like way above zero, and it should kind of sort of be zero, should trend to zero, kind of tells me that it's not a linear graph. Once we know it's not linear, then it's recognizing like what is y proportional to? In this case, it's square root of x. And that's just knowing those graph shapes from like algebra 1 or algebra 2. And of course, it's okay if you ever forget them or you want to check yourself to graph it in a graphing calculator. y equals square root of x, we'll get a shape like that. Then, once we did that, we simply graphed our original y variable, don't change that, with the new x variable that we identified from identifying the shape of the graph. In this case, it was the square root of the mass, and so we put the square root of the mass over there. That's y equals mx plus b equation. That we understand. That we know. Get the equation of the best fit line. And then since I theoretically know that that equation should look like this, I can use that to find one of the constants in the equation. And so in this case, this, um, the spring constant. So you guys are going to do something very similar, only you're going to do it with a pendulum. So the last thing we're going to do today is talk about your pendulum lab before we leave. Okay, so basically your job right now is to do the same sort of experiment for a simple pendulum. Theoretically, kind of the same theory that we saw with the spring, the period of a pendulum should be uh, proportional only to the length, actually the square root of the length. Spoiler alert, that's the theory, and g. And so first job is to kind of test that. How does the length of the, of the string in a pendulum actually affect the period of the pendulum? And then from this, if that is true, then we should be able to kind of do something similar to what I did with the spring and use this to calculate g. So all this year I've been telling you it's 9.8 newtons per kilogram, or 9.8 meters per second squared, whichever you prefer. Today, you have an opportunity to actually test that. So real quick, before you jump into that, let's talk briefly about how a pendulum works. We want to demonstrate this whole L having an effect thing. Um, when you make a pendulum, you want to try to connect it to something that allows it to swing as freely as possible. And so if you tie it to like a, um, I don't know, like a banister rail or something like that, um, the banister rail will prevent it from really swinging. 
And so on this apparatus, get to where you can see at the top, this apparatus has a peg and there's like a notch cut in the peg. And then I can just slip the string through the peg and then it's real easy to adjust the length. That's key. Um, and it can swing freely. Second thing to know, we want to always keep the mass the same, even though the mass shouldn't matter. Spoiler alert, sorry. Um, and we want to try to keep the amplitude, like the distance we pull it back the same. We don't want to pull it back that much. So this is not a simple pendulum. Like the string is not tight the entire time. And that's the last thing you want to make sure of. Make sure that there's enough mass on the end of the string so that the string is tight. You don't want it to be slack. So pull it back 10 degrees or so, let it go. There's your simple pendulum. So you got get an idea of how fast that's oscillating, period. And then let's make the string a lot longer and release it again. So you can get an idea for how fast that's oscillating. So do a bunch of links of your pendulum, measure the period, use the good technique that I showed you. Like, do it 10 times and divide by 10 to get the length for one, or excuse me, the period for one. Um, and then do as many different lengths as possible. Um, the data should be nonlinear, according to theory. And so if it's nonlinear data, then you need more points than you would if it was linear. And so, you know, 10 is probably like a good minimum value. Um, so do a bunch of different trials and then do as wide a range as possible. So when you get your data, Get G, calculate the percent error, all those fun things. And as always, if you have questions, please ask. I'll see you all next time. Ta-ta.